In this video, I'm going to talk about constraints and show you how to set them up. Constraints are used to model systems that would be impractical to simulate with collisions alone, such as hinges, chains, and joints. They limit or remove the constrained body's degrees of freedom, and for an example of what that means, consider a door on a hinge. The hinge eliminates all translational degrees of freedom, since the door is fixed to the hinge pivot, and it also eliminates two degrees of rotational freedom, since the door can only rotate about one axis. Hinges in Havoc behave the same way, and I'll show you how to set one up. We'll start with a demo that attaches a single box to a hinge. The hinge is fixed in place, so the box just swings from a point in space. I have the constraint viewer enabled, so we can also see a visualization of the hinge. The blue line represents the hinge axis, the red cross represents the point on the box that's attached to the hinge, and the white cross, which you can just kind of barely see here, represents the location of the hinge. What the hinge constraint tries to accomplish is, one, keeping the red and white crosses in the same place, and two, limiting the body's rotation to the blue axis only. If you look carefully, you can see it's not quite perfect, especially if I speed it up, it gets a little bit further off, but it's pretty close. Let's take a look at the code. The world and box creation are standard and should be familiar from previous videos, so I'm just going to focus on the hinge. There are two objects that we need to set up, a hinge constraint data and a constraint instance. The hinge data describes the properties of the hinge. It needs to know the points on the constrained bodies that are attached to the hinge and the axes that they rotate about. In this code, I've used the function set in world space to provide that information. This lets me specify the location and orientation of the hinge in world space, so essentially I can say, here's where the hinge is, and whatever point on the box is touching that gets attached. The first argument is the transform of the box I want to constrain. The second argument is the identity transform, because in this case we're not constraining to another object, but to a fixed point in the world. And then the next two arguments are the position and the direction of the hinge axis. Once the hinge data is set up, I can create a constraint instance which applies the hinge data to actual bodies in the world. And you'll notice that one of the bodies I pass is HKP world get fixed rigid body. And again, that's because I'm constraining the box to a fixed point rather than to another body. Often connecting two bodies is what you want to do though, so let's see how. First I'll just create a second box, give it a new name, and I'm going to position it so that its corner is just touching the corner of the box that we already have. Now I'm going to update the constraint setup. So I'll pass in the new body's transform, and I'll also pass it to the constraint instance. Let's see what we get. Now the two boxes are hinged to each other, but they're not quite behaving right. As you can see, they jiggle around a little bit on the ground instead of settling down like they're supposed to. And the reason for that is that their corners are colliding, and the forces from those collisions are conflicting with the forces from the constraint, destabilizing the system. And there are a couple of ways that we could resolve this. We could move the boxes apart, which the hinge demos that come with the SDK do. But we could also disable collisions between the two boxes. In general, bodies that are constrained to each other and also colliding can cause instability, so it's a good thing to avoid, and I'll show you how to do that. So I'm going to paste in some code that creates a new collision filter, and collision filtering was covered in a previous video, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about how it works, but essentially I'm putting both boxes in the same system group, and then disabling collisions between their subsystem IDs. And now that we've done that, let's see what happens. Now the hinge is behaving correctly, and the boxes no longer jitter, but of course we have a new problem, which is that the boxes now intersect each other, and that doesn't look right. So to fix this, I'm going to use a limited hinge. This is the same as a normal hinge, except that it also limits rotation about the hinge axis. And it's pretty easy to set up. First I have to replace the hinge constraint data with a limited hinge constraint data. And then, in addition to the existing setup, I need to specify the angular limits. And the boxes start positioned so that their corners are touching, so they can rotate 90 degrees in either direction. And that's the limits that I've set here. So let's run it one more time and see what happens. So the hinge is still working, but the bodies are no longer able to intersect each other because they hit the angular limit of the hinge before they can do that. So that looks pretty good. Hinge is just one type of constraint out of many, but setting up other constraints is usually a similar procedure that just uses different parameters, and there are plenty of demos in the SDK to walk you through it. To finish up, I'm just going to go over a few more details that are common to all constraints. 
First, as I discussed earlier, I used set in world space to configure the hinge, but there's an alternative called set in local space. This allows you to specify the pivot and axis in the local coordinates of each object being constrained. The constraint ultimately stores data in local space regardless of how you set it up, so set in world space is just a convenience function. Next, as you might guess, it's possible to have multiple constraint instances that share the same constraint data. Constraint data is always relative to the bodies being constrained, so you could create multiple hinged pairs of boxes like the ones shown in this video, all in different places but sharing the same constraint data. And finally, a quick point about constraint stability. As you saw in the demo, the constraint solver doesn't satisfy constraints exactly, it approximates. Part of the way it does this is through predictive error calculation, which is dependent on the step length. As a result, changes in step length can destabilize constraints, so it's recommended to use a fixed step length or change it slowly if absolutely necessary. Now that you know how hinges work, a good next step would be to take a look through the SDK demos and see all of the different sorts of constraints that Havoc offers.